Welcome to Halting Toward Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Uttinger. We are missing Brian Broom tonight, so we will save our intro question fun game thing that we were going to do this week for next week when Brian will be with us, we hope. But today we're talking about the economics of sacrifice. We've talked a little bit about what the Old Testament sacrifices were. We talked about the function that they served in Old Testament Israel. And this week we're talking about the economics of sacrifice, what it cost, what that meant, and what the implications are for international trade, for example. (laughs) So sacrifice means death. This is kind of something that you talk about from time to time, Greg, that we talk about sacrificing time and sacrificing opportunities sometimes, but it's not really a sacrifice unless something dies. Yeah, this, this started when some of our students at school would write us thank you letters that became more and more generically the same thank you letter (laughs) that would say, and our teacher sacrificed so much and it got annoying. I know they they meant well, they were echoing what they had been told by their elders and unfortunately perhaps by some of us. Uh, But that's not the way the Bible uses the word sacrifice. Sacrifice is not giving up something you want or even something you need. Sacrifice means killing something. That's the, insofar as the, as the word appears in scripture directly, that's always the meaning. And I, I pointed out to our staff, our teachers, and they to the younger kids, that it is not a sacrifice to do what God calls you to. Now, if, if by that you mean that by faith I'm united to Christ and in him am a living sacrifice in all that I am and do, good and well. We all are sacrificed in that sense. And and worship itself is sacrificial as we come to to Christ and um, let him put to death more and more the old man, uh, do heart surgery on us by his word. But if it means Christian school teachers don't get paid very well, and that's a sacrifice, no, when, when you work for the king, you don't complain that the assignment he gave you <laughs> does not meet your economic standards of livelihood. You go where you're sent, you do what you're told, and you rejoice at the privilege of working for the king. So yeah, for a while there, I haven't mentioned it as much lately, but for a while there, I was pounding on it a lot that we need to stop talking in in the poor me voice that says, I sacrifice so much to do this. Well, then stop it and go someplace else and do something <laughs> that will get you the kind of income and lifestyle that you apparently really want. And quit complaining to Jesus that he's a hard taskmaster. So in that sense, uh, yeah, we need to get away from that kind of language because it's sloppy. And because it is the, the language of, of worship, there, there are better ways to approach anything where we have to give up something or we have to, we can say scrimp and save, that's fine. But when we start talking about sacrificing, that's biblical language. And we, we at the very least need to be very careful in what we communicate to ourselves, let alone to our kids. Uh, so when we come to talk here about sacrifice, we're actually talking largely about killing things. Bulls, goats, sheep, pigeons, doves. Uh, and whereas plants are not uh, soulishly alive, we kill some plants too. <laughs> and we cut up some frankincense trees pretty well so that they're bleeding all over the place. Um, and I suspect that that's not an accident. We'll talk in, in a bit about how frankincense is made. Uh, but there, there's at least one, there, there is one message in this, obviously. The bulls, the goats, the sheep were expensive. I don't know what they cost now, years ago now. It's been quite a few years. Some buddy in the Irvine Mesa 4-H club said, expect to pay a hundred uh, and 300 for a registered dairy goat kid between a 150 to 300, 350 for a pygmy goat. Those are little bitty things. I don't know if being pygmy makes it more expensive or less, <laughs> but with inflation, it's, I'm sure the price has gone up since then. So you're offering a bowl. <laughs> I don't know. Do you have any idea how much they cost today? I, I haven't I done have the recent no research. 
I don't um, think I even know any dairy farmers. No. I know um, other kinds of farmers. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the, the yes, it, worship. We, we, we've talked before about how bloody worship was. It was also very expensive, also very time consuming. Even though the priest did a lot of the work, presumably you stayed and watched. Uh, you killed the animal and watched it drain, and then watch as he sliced and diced and put it on the altar. You just didn't say, "Well, I guess we're done for today. I'll let the priest <laughs> take over." It was you, you. You stood and saw all this bloody mess because there's a message there for you. This is what you deserve. And the reason that sacrifice means death is that's what the altar means. Uh, things have died and then they're placed on the altar. Before they go on the altar, they have to die. And if we are going to be living sacrifices, we have to have died in Christ. We come to the altar and there's a choice. I can either suffer the death penalty for my sins in eternal hell, or I can give myself wholly to God because I've died in Christ. My life is forfeit one way or the other. It's either, either forfeit to eternal hell or it's forfeit to God's sovereignty, to Christ's lordship. And so it is a life and death thing in the full sense of the word. And to bring it down to the level of, yeah, I gave up uh, chocolate for Lent is not getting <laughs> anywhere near what we're talking about or watering down the language of, of you know, we, 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 we sacrificed that extra burger so that we could give a little to the church. No, it's not hurting enough yet. That's not, and it doesn't and it doesn't work. That's not that's not enough. Sacrifice should be expensive. It, it it sends that message, and yet fundamentally, we're talking about killing something. Mm -hmm. Can we take a minute to clarify the distinction between sacrifice and fasting? Since you just brought up Lent. <laughs> Well, they're fasting, not the same thing. They're not the same thing because <laughs> in sacrifice you're killing something, and fasting means in, in the biblical sense. I'm I'm not going to appeal to anybody else's tradition of what they may understand by fasting, but fasting is doing without something, normally food, so that you can devote yourself uh, to prayer or to some other task that God has set before you. Isaiah speaks of the fast that God has chosen as uh, breaking every bond. Um, I don't remember the exact language without looking. The idea of setting people free and ministering your mm -hmm. poor, feeding your, your bread to the poor and, and releasing them from their bondage, that kind of thing. To be so busy in the work of active, even aggressive charity that you forget to eat. You don't have time mm -hmm. to eat. Or you take your food and you give it to someone who actually needs it and then you go do your thing before God. Sometimes it's prayer. And prayer and fasting are also often associated with scripture, but there are other other things um, that can accompany it. And the, the main focus seems to be removing yourself from distractions or turning the very distraction of hunger into a renewed symbol. Oh, I'm hungry. Oh, that's right. I'm supposed to be praying. <laughs> Let me get back. Let me refocus here. Uh, the Bible never suggests that simply not having food is somehow spiritually beneficial. And the passage in Isaiah. Wouldn't that be kind of gnostic? <laughs> yes, but we're 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 good at gnosticism in in America. Um, here's the passage from Isaiah fifty eight. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching to God. So that's God's word to the prophet Israel. Israel's response is, Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and, and, and they see, and thou seest not? Wherefore have we afflicted our soul, and thou takest no knowledge? Behold, and God answers, Behold, in the day of your fast you find pleasure and exact all your labors. Behold, you fast for strife and debate and to smite with the fist of wickedness. You shall not fast as you do this day to make your voice to be heard on high. Is it such a fast that I've chosen? A day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will thou call this a fast and an acceptable day to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I've chosen? To loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke? Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry? and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house. When thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thy own flesh. And he goes on and connects it later with the Sabbath day. 
it's not simply abstinence that constitutes virtue, but laying aside things that are pleasurable so that we can devote ourselves to action at hand, action that is necessary, action that actually benefits somebody. And so, as I say, giving up chocolate for Lent doesn't carry any brownie points with God as such, unless it is an opportunity to devote yourself to to the work of the Lord in some way, more than just saving some calories. If you if you have a problem with gluttony, probably you need to do more than just scratch out chocolate for Lent. So yeah, so that's that's fasting. Sacrifice is of a different thing. It's it's portraying. It's God portraying, if you keep coming back to this, that God portrays in the sacrament that he set before us the penal substitutionary death of his son. Our guilt, our need for a substitute, and the all-sufficiency of Christ as our substitute, as our covenant representative, who in his own body bore our sins on the cross, so that we being dead to sin might live into righteousness. That is the gospel, and that's what sacrifice is about. And... And, and recognizing this and thinking about this and, and, and preaching this by our actions may take some time and may take some cost. God, God does not need any money from us, although his church may, other Christians may. But he does want us to be serious and he sometimes wants to get our attention and say, hey, this, this, this is serious. Um, don't give me don't give me stuff that costs you nothing. David says that mm -hmm. when he's trying to buy the Temple Mount and the Jebusite uh, owner, who may have been a, a former king of the Jebusites, but at least it says he, as a king, did give to the king the 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 things he needed. But he he says, or really the Jebusite says, "Well, take it all. You need this to save Jerusalem. Take it all. I give it all to you." And David says, "No, I will not." take this from you for nothing, nor will I give to the Lord that which costs me nothing. I'll pay you full price. And so there's there that. Isn't there a parallel there with Abraham purchasing Sarah's burial cave? Well, at least to the extent that God had promised uh, Abram the whole land of Canaan, and it was his by divine right, and yet he bought it um, in order to have a place to bury his wife because that was part of his covenant responsibility. He, he, I suppose he could have simply said, it's mine, everyone back off. And I have uh, a bunch of uh, hired or a bunch of uh, armed servants who will back me up. But rather, he humbled himself and, and paid the money to maintain the peace and to get what he needed to get on with life. So be, beyond that, I, I've not thought of, of another connection, but there may be something else I'm missing. Um, let's. So animals are expensive. You've got you to gotta have animals. Where do you get animals? Well, you go out in the in the pasture. You, wait. <laughs> now, when I was a kid, literally, I could have gone out in the pasture. Now, the animals weren't mine, but you know, at <laughs> night, I That's suppose. That's called rustling. <laughs> yes, uh, there was a huge cow pasture behind our little suburban home, or our little small town home, I guess. And there were frequently cows, and occasionally, once or twice. They managed to get to the barbed wire fence into our back 40, our back calf acre, whatever it was. And dad would go out there and have to chase them off. <laughs> you know, what do you do? You just shout a lot and jump up and down and hope they remember how they got in because that's the only way back out again. So I, I, I grew up around cows. Not that I ever did anything with them besides watch them, but they were there. And so with a lot of people in the small town I grew up with, cattle were a pretty common thing. But where I live now... There is one small island of non-civilization <laughs> in the middle of uh, it's where Placer County and Sacramento County meet, mm -hmm. where there is this large pasture area. And when my, my little Emily was like one or two, I would drive down there and there were cows in the field and a few other farm animals, which to that point she'd only seen in a book, a little children's book. Mm -hmm. And I would point and say, cow, Emily, can you say cow? I don't have to say she couldn't talk. Uh, <laughs> but that was her introduction to, to farm animals because they're not common around here. I know a family that when they would pass a herd of cows, you know, driving down the road, mm -hmm. they'd say, look at the birds, kid. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a cruel trick to play on your children. Don't do that. <laughs> um, but the, the point I was trying to make in all this is that most people don't know anything about cows. And cows are not a thing that are readily available. 
in Israel, they were fairly available. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob both did uh, sheep and cows, smaller or lesser and, and larger cattle, the Bible says. But not everybody was, not everyone in Israel was a herdsman. So you had to trade, barter, buy, sell. So division of labor was a real thing uh, in Israel, as it is everywhere, and lawful. And the Bible puts no prescriptions on, well, these are sacrificial animals. Therefore, their price must be set because you have to buy them. So we're fixing the price set. God never does that. You're on your own. It's a free market. And um, Christ, when he came amongst us and saw the buying and selling that took place in the temple, uh, was infuriated that there were monopolistic prices being set on these animals by the temple authorities to enrich themselves. The Bible does, does not provide for any of that. Now, having said that about animals, so either Israel had to be an agrarian society or it had to carry on brisk trade with some society, some nation nearby that was. Well, it seems that mo mostly they produce their own, but you know, your, your herds and livestock are going to be in need of refrigeration, I would think, now and then. So that's a thing. But when we come particularly to the to the so-called meat offering, the grain offering, tribute offering, whatever you call it, um, it, ha it came with frankincense. You were supposed to bring frankincense and put on it. And with the frankincense would go with the part that was offered on the altar and come up as a, a sweet smell before God. Also, the uh, anointing oil for the priest and the incense that was used in the holy place on the altar of incense contained frankincense. Frankincense was not something that grew in Israel. Uh, from a, a quick look at uh, Wikipedia, I knew it grew in, um, uh, in Oman, but it also grows in um, uh, Somaliland in Africa. Mm. But apparently, at least according to the website of the company that produces it in Oman, there is the richest and best and most fragrant and, and most desired um, frankincense in the world. Uh, I, and, until I did the research, original research for this, I didn't know what it was. I just assumed it was, a, it's a spice that comes from somewhere. You know. <laughs> Actually, it grows obviously on a, a particular tree. We, we would call it frankincense, but it has, it has a, a botanical name that I don't know and can't remember. It grows in the wilderness. It grows in very arid lands. In fact, you can grow out of solid rock. Hmm. It's it's not something you find in your garden or in a forest. You find it out in the desert on rocky things. And when so you, there's no imagery going on here at all. With no, the it's <laughs> no. Well, it gets worse. Uh, so you come up to this tree that has very little in the way of flowers and very little in the way of hmm. leaves. You go nothing less, to recommend it. Nothing to recommend it. And you take a piece of a metal blade and you slice its skin and it bleeds. What it bleeds is resin, a kind of silvery resin. And you walk away and you leave it for a couple of days. And you come back and that resin is beginning to harden up into, into balls or other odd shapes. Um, and and you, you take your blade and you clean it off and then you set the stuff out to dry. And it dries for four months. Mm. And only at that point can you take it and work with it and, and mold it into the pretty shapes you want and such. Uh, but it still doesn't do its thing generally unless you set fire to it. Either warm mm -hmm. it on coals or burn it. And then that will release its aroma. And um, when I was doing the same research I did for pygmy goats, uh, I saw uh, an ad that said a 3.36 ounce bottle of Omani Umash perfume with frankincense cost about three hundred and fifty dollars. Hmm. Now I don't know how much of that cost is because of the frankincense, but the the article was about frankincense, so presumably a good deal of that is the price of frankincense. It's expensive. And interestingly enough, I the the uh, article I read today said, "Oh, it's cheap." Well, I guess it depends who you are and how far you have to go to get it. <laughs> but but the point here is not so much the expense, although that's a recurring theme we see here. Worship can be very expensive. It, it's not something Israel had. In order to get it, Israel had to engage in trade with other nations. And since Israel is nowhere near Oman, this is international trade. You have to trade with somebody who trades with somebody whose camels go there. Uh, it's if you are if you've cut off all communication with the outside world, you cannot worship God the way you're supposed to. Hmm. And that's a huge thought here. The Bible never mentions it, but again, with so many things, the Bible assumes that the people who at least first heard it 
understand the cultural background since they lived in it and that either they passed on enough or we with our historical studies can fill in the gap so that we can see, or botanical studies in this case, um, what God was really asking. He was telling them implicitly, you got to trade with the rest of the nations if you're going to worship me right. There has to be some kind of intercourse back and forth between you and the Gentile world or you can't worship me the way I, the way I uh, mm. demand that you should. Wow, well, that, but how could they, you know, engage amicably with pagans who are doing all sorts of dreadful things? <laughs> I can't go buy things at the market. The people there are pagans. There's a lot of stores people will not go to, not because of they're selling wicked products, pornography or idols or something, but simply because, well, I, I hear that some of this money goes to wicked causes. When you're paying wicked people, it all goes to wicked causes. <laughs> this is something we haven't really figured out yet. I think there's earlier generations of Christians may have got that and just decided they would only frequent Christian establishments. But the, the reality is all the, all the time we engage in business with people who are not believers and the money we give them often does go to support an ungodly lifestyle. And that's not a problem. God does not hold us accountable for what they do with what they have lawfully obtained by trade. Uh, but yeah, we're going to have this. This means some things. It means we're going to have to figure out how to speak their language, at least to the degree where we can communicate the nouns that are associated with what we want to buy. <laughs> and the and, numbers. <laughs> and the numbers. We have to be able to track with them numerically so that we are ordering the right quantity and understand the price we're being charged. Or it's going to break down real fast and there's going to be a lot of disagreements and even some violence involved with uh, accusations of theft or fraud or misrepresentation or whatever else. And then and, and trade doesn't get anywhere that way. One, one of the questions I've, I've asked my kids before in economics is to what degree is uh, the, the, the separation of tongues at Babel actually affect international trade? And the answer, of course, is hardly at all, <laughs> because there's always somebody who has the guts to go over and make a fool of himself and point at things and raise numbers and do some kind of pidgin English or pidgin Hebrew or whatever to try to communicate because they see dollar signs. They see profit. Uh, it's not that hard. Uh, as long as you don't get killed for crossing borders, you shouldn't <laughs> to actually make a deal with someone who speaks a different language. Eventually, you'll figure out each other's language because you want more. Uh, you want to do better business. You want uh, other things that, that they may know about. You want to know about more opportunities on the other side of their country. Wait, I see you got that. We, we know make that. Who did them? Who's them? Tell me about them. I need to see them. Um, so, but if, if that's true on the economic level, how much more should it be on the level of basic evangelism, of communicating truth to the whole world? It was not Israel's job to go out and be missionaries, although on occasion they, they did. Sometimes they were forced to, like when God scattered them across the Babylonian world and, and afterwards. But God placed them at the crossroads of three continents with that, that trade routes went right through Israel. And they would have many opportunities to talk to many people and find out about products that were far away. And so trade would start out like that, and then the Israelites could pursue it um, with more vigor as, as time went by. Now, so that, that's one thing. Something else, and as I was rereading my notes, something else struck me. It's, it, you mentioned it in, in, in the notes for the show, and, and I kind of looked at it and said, wait, how does that come in until I reread the notes and said, <laughs> oh, that the tree in the garden, the tree of life. It was the first sacrament. It was a tree. Adam and Eve didn't have to do anything but reach up and pluck a fruit and eat it. Uh, there was no distinction between the part you chew and the part you drink. The juice and the fruit were wrapped up together. Uh, if they wanted to sit down, they could sit at the base of the tree and lean against it, or they could climb up in the tree there. Uh, the tree of life was the throne of God. Because when Adam and Eve left, it was the tree of life that was guarded by the cherubim and throughout the rest of Scripture, cherubim guard, guard God's throne. But what a throne. It's a tree. Hmm. Now we fast forward into uh, the Mosaic economy. We have a tabernacle. We have sawed boards. We have hammered gold. We have squeezed, pressed fruit, both for the olive oil and for the wine on the uh, 
Shoka, we have grain that's been pounded. And uh, going back to the tribute offering, the, particularly the, the offering that says that all of uh, my stuff is God's, that was expressed by not only um, sheaves of grain, but more particularly by cakes that were baked or fried, which means in order to, to bring the sacrifice to God, I need to plant wheat, harvest wheat, uh, thresh wheat, turn the threshed wheat into flour, find an oven, find, make an oven, start a fire, <laughs> bake the thing, figure out how leaven works, and and have some kind of iron skillet or something to bake it in or to fry it in. All of these things have to happen in order for me to bring a simple offering to God. I, God's tapping my land, my time, my labor, my tools. These are the basic elements of economics. Without these, there is no economic life. And yet God puts a tax on all of these. All of these things you bring to me as tribute, and my worship is not complete until you have. So in order to do what God demands in worship, man has to go out and work. He has to subdue the earth. He has to plant. He has to reap. He has to build. He has to uh, work with metals. He has to work with fire. There's a lot that has to go on in order for God to be acceptably worshipped. Now, fast forward to the New Testament. Uh, the, the liturgy is much simpler, the ritual uh, much more not complicated. But they, we still speak of the table of the Lord. And traditionally, there has been a table. There have been goblets or cups or a cup at least for wine which is still something that is produced by mostly mechanical means, unless you get some Italian mamas out there stomping <laughs> on the grapes, as in one episode of I Love Lucy. You know, they, and then the bread. You, the bread is made, hopefully not pressed out of something by machine. It's actually some kind of bread. And, and we're supposed to sit in God's presence. So you sit at the table. Someone has to make chairs. And so, again, even in something as simple as the Lord's Supper, we're still reflecting man's, the ongoing success of man's dominion over the planet. This is what we bring to God in worship. And if we don't, if we are a primitive people incapable even of growing wheat, then we are not able to worship God the way he planned, the way he says. And, and I understand, in, at least in some missionary situations, this has been a problem. What if you go to a country where it doesn't have wheat, it doesn't have grapes? Mm -hmm. Can you substitute? I suppose you this can for a while. This is the rice cake broken for you. Yeah, this is the rice cake broken for you. This is the guava juice poured for you. I don't know what you do at that point. But since it's one thing to substitute an emergency, we, we have precedent for that kind of thing. But to be satisfied with that is to ignore what God has actually said. And so the culture needs to move toward wheat of all things. Maybe not processed the way we do it in America and the West, but certainly wheat certainly grapes, fermentation, and all that. And so these, these very ordinances of worship do have economic, and ecological, and cultural implications for, for our work, for our priorities, and for what it is we're to bring to God. We bring to God more than just our hearts. And when we say, oh, but God has my heart, he just doesn't have my wallet, then there's a problem there because he probably doesn't have your heart either. There's some sort of connection here. I'm trying to put my finger on it between what we've been talking about and that essay, I Pencil, where mm, all mm -hmm. the different pieces have to come together. Nobody can make a pencil. It's the result of this vast, spontaneous coordination. <laughs> yeah, and, and our, our libertarian friends will, if we have any left, will, <laughs> <laughs> will appreciate this. Uh, Leonard Reed wrote the the article I pencil and I make sure all my students read it. Uh, no one knows. No one knows how to make a pencil. No one person knows how to make a pencil, mm -hmm. because what goes into a pencil? Well, you've got the wood, which comes from I believe California, someplace. The graphite, which comes from mines, some other country, some other part of the world. Uh, if it's real rubber, you've got rubber plants. If it's not real rubber, then you're dealing with something else. You've got the little metal thing that holds in place. That's mining tools and mines, which, again, are someplace else in the planet. Uh, the lacquer, the yellow lacquer that goes on it, again, someplace else. And then the tools to do all these things, to saw and to shape the wood, to mine the graphite, to mine the metal. Uh, think of all the tools that go into that. And then 
we're already in different parts of the world. How do you get it all in one location for the person who finally puts all the pieces together? That involves some kind of transportation system, uh, mostly ships and trains, I would imagine, because I don't think we could fly that on airplanes. But these things have come into being, and in a sense, the need, cre the need and the opportunity created. People need a writing device. What if I were to? But where, where would you find that, Bob? Well, uh, I don't know. Uh, where, where the, the, the people over there who make those rubber balls? Where do they get their rubber? Well, I think they're someplace in India. I don't know. Well, let's let's check it out, or maybe they can, you know. And you start looking for ways to bring this thing together. And there you have the imagination, the creativity, the entrepreneur, the willingness to think in new ways and try new things and take a risk to bring it all together. And is is that exactly what this is talking about? Maybe not, but it's certainly harmonious. They, they go together. Uh, he, what we see in the um, in the frankincense that goes on the altar, both altars, is the bringing together of things from different places to create a product. And the people who cut the frankincense probably have no idea where it's going to end up or what they're going to do with it, nor do they really care. Probably. <laughs> Less, and less until at some point Israel apostatizes and suddenly there's no longer a demand for frankincense. And, but then what's the world going to hear? What's Oman going to hear? Oh, those Israelites who were your best buyers? Yeah, they've forsaken their God. They don't need your frankincense anymore. They abandoned their God? What kind of people are these? <laughs> yeah, that's not good. But you know, certainly we, we, we bind all this together. And, and the Ascension offering and the tribute offering are testimonies that we belong to God with all that we are, all we have all of our stuff, all of our time, all of our energy. And, and this was the heart of worship under the Old Covenant, that Jesus, the Messiah, the Lamb of God, he dies for me. Uh, he takes away my sins. Penal substitution, he, he, he bears the penalty, the just penalty I deserve. But in doing so, he buys me as a possession for God. With all of my stuff, that means I got a lot of work to do, not to earn my salvation, but to finish the work that God has called me to and to show my thankfulness and joy in what God has done in saving me from hell. And so sacrifice leads to a theology of dominion, but it, we have to get the order right. We don't do these things so that God will bless us. We do these things because God has blessed us and because he now he set us free from sin to serve him. And we want to go on worshiping. We want to go on saying thank you. We want to go on preaching the gospel, whether by word or by ritual, by sacrament. And in order for that to happen, some economic realities have to go into place. And an agnostic, long uh, theology will not understand this. These are all worldly things. What, what matter they to us? They can all perish. All that matters is my soul's rightness with God. And the Bible never teaches that anywhere. It teaches us not to hold the things of the world too closely because they're here on loan for us for now. But one day there are greater treasures and greater riches, and there's no notion that they are not in some degree physical, real things that God is preparing us for. So all of that and more gets wrapped in this. And in one parting observation, men take these things, they take the frankincense, well, they take the frankincense tree, and they apply a steel blade, and they apply time and labor. And what finally ends up in the temple is not, hey, I brought your frankincense tree. Is something that's been processed as opposed to something that's natural. Mm -hmm. The same thing with the wheat, the same thing with the wine. These are all things that are processed through human labor and time. The word process has become kind of a um, bad word <laughs> these days. If something's processed. We, we don't like it. We want the natural thing. Well, you know, some natural things aren't all that great. Olives, naturally, are inedible. In fact, they're poison. Pretty gross. <laughs> yeah. Um, I actually grew up across the street from an old olive orchard. So. Oh, did, you ever, did you ever try to eat any of the olives? I did, and it was a bad decision. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not It's not a good thing. There are many, the world is cursed. Mm -hmm. And the whole generation that came through the 60s and bore fruit on into the 90s had this idea, anything that's natural is better. Not necessarily. Nature <laughs> is not normative anymore. And sometimes human effort is not only required to, to bring out the best in a thing, but to correct the curse in a thing. And, and so what we see here on the altar is stuff that's not purely natural, but stuff that's been processed by human labor, time, energy, and intelligence. The processed is often what God demanded on the altar. In fact, I, I can't think of anything on, offhand that wasn't in some degree processed to get there. Even the, the grains that grew in the field were not things that grew wild. 
they were the work of the farmers' efforts and, and, and experience and intelligence. They didn't just spring up someplace. Oh, look, wildflowers are bringing them to God. God knows where the man's wildflowers. <laughs> he in already March. owns them. <laughs> he already owns them. He can see them anywhere he wants. Yeah. I remember a friend of ours using this illustration about music that sound waves are naturally chaotic. Like there's, right. when we just listen to the sounds around us, there's not order there. It's through effort and a kind of redemption that we order yeah. them, we set them right. And that's what God does to to us and to our history is reaches into the chaos that we've created by messing right. with his idea and set it right. So to do this on a smaller scale is to imitate God. Yes, absolutely. And again, we're back to talking about dominion, but we're trying to place it in a biblical framework. Dominion doesn't mean go out and take over things and, <laughs> right. and rule the world and make everyone behave. That's not it. And it's unfortunate that the word dominion is kind of has that association and connotation these days. Uh, dominion is, first of all, an attribute of God. God has absolute dominion, and he rules in a kindly, orderly, generous way, uh, letting his reign fall on the just and the unjust. There will be a day of final judgment. But until then, God is exceedingly gracious for the sake of Christ, and his grace overflows into what some people call common grace, restraining grace, that blesses everyone, at least outwardly, for a while. And so our dominion, as the discussion of uh, fasting earlier, uh, we don't need to go out with our, our wand of faith detection and say, are you, are you, are you saved? Beep, 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 beep. Meh. Oh, I guess not. I guess I can't help. I can't give money to you because you're not a true believer. Beep, beep, beep. He is. I'll give him. I'll help him. I won't help you. There, there, you give money a, to the believer. The believer turns around and hands it to the unbeliever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yes, we, we all know Paul's injunction if a man shouldn't work, neither should he eat. But that's a broad description to the church and, 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 and a basic philosophy of life. It doesn't mean that if someone stands in your door with his hat and says, hey, I'm awfully hungry, could you spare a sandwich? That we are sinning by giving him a sandwich. <laughs> now, we probably should tell him about Jesus in the process because yeah. Jesus said a cup of cold water in his name. Uh, but uh, there's, there's this, this dominion thing is not saying, well, come be my slave and I will give you. No, it's... How can I help you, really help you? Maybe it's giving you food. Maybe it's not, depending on the circumstances. And God puts us in the place of making hard calls in charity and wisdom, but also in justice. Uh, and, and that's what the Bible's talking. When it talks about us as kings and priests before God, it's always kings and priests together. We're not sometimes kings and sometimes priests. It's, it's one office, prophet, king, priest before God. And so we're always working for what us is a balancing act, which in God comes naturally because that's who he is. But we, because of our sins, sometimes see it as a balance between mercy and justice, between holding a tight line and opening a white hand. But the call to be like Jesus, uh, he did not ask how many of the 5,000 believed in him before he fed them. They were covenant people. Actually, with 4,000, they weren't even all covenant people. A lot of them were Gentiles, and yet he fed them. So was that an act of dominion? Yes, it was. He asserted the authority of God over creation and showed it before men. I have the power to make stuff out of nothing. I have the power to feed you. And there are spiritual lessons here as well. So as we talk about dominion, we need to not get sidetracked into some kind of political model where we are grabbing seats of power to reshape the world. That's not it. The cup of cold water in Jesus' name with Christian testimony is far more effective in and of itself than circulating political fact sheets or whatever, petitions. Not to say that's all, the other's wrong, but we need our priorities straight. Mm -hmm. well, the river of water of life that flows from God's garden is the spirit of the gospel. It's not a stream of uh, votes for a right-wing candidate. <laughs> yeah. Well, do you have any recommendations for us this evening? Yes. Getting married and having children. <laughs> That's a good recommendation. That's a good recommendation. God kind of recommended dawn of creation. <laughs> uh, my own children are now at the point where two of them are, well, one of them is 21. Another one's about to turn 20 in like a month or less. The other's 18 going on 30. 
Um, <laughs> and they're, they're at the point where they're beginning to get their own social lives and make even even their own theological choices in some areas. It's which church are you going to go to? Okay, you know what you're doing? You talk to God about this? They're, they're grown-ups, nearly so. And yet this last year or so has been, in many ways, one of the best of my life, despite COVID, despite the riots, despite government intrusion and oppression. Because interestingly enough, it's forced us to be home more together. And it is my absolute delight to sit around with my family and hear my girls and my wife all talk about whatever. <laughs> the conversations range from cooking to old movies, to old books, to new books, to songs that are not top 40, at least not now. They might have been 30 years ago. <laughs> uh, gardening and um, all kinds of just other philosophy, theology. It, it is, and to do so politely, my girls are very different from one another. And yet they've learned to respect one another and listen to one another. They all have jobs. They go to college. They all read a lot, even the one who says she doesn't. <laughs> and it's been, it's been a great thing. And these are girls who are going to go on having an effect long after I'm gone. I'm much older than my daughters are. Uh, but they've been a tremendous blessing to me, especially of late. And I know that God does not give the blessing of children to everybody, at least not right away, and sometimes not with some, without some help. And I would never make it a matter of, of guilt or such a thing. But it, it, insofar as it's possible, it's a wonderful path that God has called us on and generally makes possible for most married people and to hold back from it indefinitely because I'm too busy or I have a career or I'm afraid of the pain even although I understand that I don't I've never given birth I've had a few kidney stones which they say is close whatever the excuses and the reasons are the justifications children are a wonderful thing at least they can be so I recommend getting married and having children that's my recommendation today. Well, that's infinitely better than my recommendation. <laughs> <laughs> what is yours, Emily? I have an old book to recommend. Okay, what's your old book? Um, this is called The Heliand, H-E-L-I-A-N-D. Have you heard of it? No, it is... I have not. <laughs> <laughs> it is a collection of songs written uh -huh. by a monk, I gather, Ministering to the Germanic peoples subdued by Charlemagne in the oh, 9th century. Okay, that was kind of classy, though. See how you did that. <laughs> so he, he kind of, he tells the story of the Gospels, adapting here and there to the Saxon cultural context. And uh -huh. there are points where he's completely unorthodox, like certain yeah. points, zero out of 10 for theology. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know... I've never shared the gospel with a ninth century pagan, so <laughs> who am I to, you know, yeah. really throw mm. a stone here? But he does some interesting things over the course of, of the work. There's 71 songs or something like that. Um, and he does what I call the Joss Whedon thing, which another friend of mine calls the anime thing, where you start off with certain assumptions and uh -huh. then you start to question those assumptions as you go uh -huh. along. Mm -hmm. um, in this case, it's fate and time being ultimate because that's what you know the Norse right. mythology was, and that's sort of the worldview that of the people that he's trying to minister to. So he starts off, and it's like, oh, this is very syncretistic, and then it goes on and it goes on, and then he has to sort of deal with God ordained this, but this person chose this, but what? How is what is fated? different from what God ordained. So he yes. doesn't, you know, draw it to its full conclusion, but I think it's very interesting what he does. The translation I have is by G. Ronald Murphy. He's a Jesuit. Mm -hmm. um, and the translation is a little bit clunky, but only because it's so transparent. Like you can tell <laughs> kind of when it's human beings every time instead of like mankind or something like that yeah. like it just grates on me a little bit it's like yeah, it would sound yeah, much yeah. grander if you just said men yes, um, and indeed. it wouldn't bother me but <laughs> anyway it was a very fun read and i would recommend it to the discerning reader who enjoys norse mythology okay very good by the way some large animal just walked past your back window what? i would like to say it was a really huge cat, but I don't know for sure. It was just kind of slinking by. 
That's terrifying because we have a balcony. <laughs> Oh, like, was well, it on the balcony? No, it's on the, it looks like there's a sidewalk out there past, yeah. the, past the railing. It was there, but yeah. it was it was big, quite big. Oh, I'm not going outside ever again. <laughs> <laughs> all right, with that, we will <laughs> say you all good night. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for this conversation. Thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Thank you to our financial supporters. If you would like to join their number, you can visit our website, anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion. Um, that is also where you can find all of our show notes and transcripts for every episode. So thanks so much for listening. See you next time.